Next, from Chicago, we speak one-on-one -on -one with Sheila Weinberg about her efforts to create accurate accounting of the money government spends at the federal and state level. We'll hear how governments use their own versions of accounting to confuse citizens about their actual amounts of spending and revenue. And we'll hear how Illinois compares to other states in terms of the amount of debt each owes per citizen. This runs about 30 minutes. Sheila Weinberg, you're the CEO of uh, Truth in Accounting, and we appreciate you joining us on the Illinois Channel. Well, thanks for having me. We, we spoke with you before, and you have undertaken uh, over the years uh, an effort to uh, bring, I would say, a little greater transparency to what's actually happening in government finances. You recently published this report, the state of the state, the financial state of the states, I should say. I did a report on all 50 states. Let's focus uh, on Illinois. Uh, what uh, did you find about Illinois and how does it rank? Uh, what we did is we calculated, uh, we went to everything, single states, financial statements, and the retirement plans, and we calculated um, their per taxpayer burden. And Illinois came out with a $26,800 per taxpayer burden, which is the amount of money each taxpayer would have to pay in order to pay, fund all our bills. And that is the third worst. Hmm. And one of the things that, uh, let's talk, when you have truth in accounting, why is that label applicable when we talk about government? Well, it's applicable because in our report we note that Illinois has $66 billion of off-balance sheet liabilities um, because the governments get to use different accounting than corporations and according to their generally accepted accounting principles for state and local governments, the state of Illinois does not have part of their balance sheet all of their retirement uh, system liabilities. And a, and a corporation, when it has a pension obligation to pay to its employees, they generally, or they would carry their, their pension obligations on their books, is that right? They would carry the liability on their books, and also they have rules um, from the IRS that they have to fund those, and states do not, they do not have that, uh, that requirement. Obviously, we're talking a, a great deal these days about uh, the state's pension systems and funding them. Uh, I presume you looked at that, the, the state of Illinois' pensions systems and burdens. Um, what can you tell us about that? Well, I can tell you that the, between the pensions and the retiree health care benefits, the state has an unfunded liability of more than $90 billion. And the reason that that is is because what the legislature, the, the budget is done on a, what we call political math and they only have to include the checks that they write. So the politicians figured out, well, if I promise benefits, uh, then I don't, those don't have to be in my balanced budget calculations. Those are gonna, we don't write the check this year, they're gonna be paid in future years. So they just continued to promise these benefits without writing the check to fund, put money aside to pay them. I have heard uh, various numbers all over the board. Um, one of the numbers I frequently hear uh, relative to how much the state pension system is underfunded is I often hear $80 billion. What, what numbers do you, uh, did you come up with? What we came up with for the pension system was $62 um, billion, which was based on the June 30, 2009 financial statements of the state and the actuarial reports. Um, some people come up with higher numbers because they use uh, different, what they call discount rate. You know, how much are my assets going to earn in the plan? And the, and the actuary, the state has the actuaries using an 8% discount rate, i.e. the plans are going to earn 8% um, over the next decades. Um, and so some people believe that should be a lot lower. Um, so they might recalculate the numbers using 4%. Um, but we felt that let's go ahead and use the government's numbers. That way they can't argue with our numbers. We're not going to have an uh, argument about the numbers because they're their numbers. So we're, we often hear uh, Herman Cain who is saying that they change the assumptions. You're, you're using the same assumptions. You're saying, okay, let's pretend they're making 8%. They probably are not. Very few people are making that these days. Yes, and we, we don't want to argue about our number. We want to get to the point where the public understands the problem. And using their numbers, we believe the public understands the problem um, because they're, according to the, our calculations, there are 100 
and $10 billion in the hole using their numbers. Um, so we felt that in order to jump to solutions faster, let's not argue about the number. Let's just use their number and we'll go from there. What were the over? So aside from pensions, I, I presume you looked at a number of other criteria to uh, measure a state, and, and what were the things you looked at? Well, what we did is we took the state financial statement and we calculated from their balance sheet how much assets we have available to pay our bills. Then we took their reported liabilities, and then we added those off balance sheet pension liabilities, and we looked at all their actuarial reports. And that's how we calculated how money, how much money is needed by the state to pay its bills. When we talk about, you know, most of us are not accountants. When we talk mm -hmm. about off-balance liabilities, what all would that include? That would be, well, what the... Um, what the what are they and what would it include? I it suppose. would include all the pension plans, so the teacher's retirement plan, the um, employee uh, retirement plan, uh, the legislator's retirement plan, and... Uh, I can't remember the other ones, but all the retirement plans, um, what the actuaries do is they say, here's the assets we have available, here are all the liabilities that, okay, here is how much money is needed to fund all those liabilities, uh, benefits, and here's the unfunded liability. You write in here on, on your report about Illinois that Illinois is $55 billion worth of assets, but most of these assets are not available to meet the state's obligations. 29 billion of those assets are in infrastructure like roads and parks, et cetera, uh, and cannot be used to pay the bills. And the use of 6.4 billion of assets is also restricted by law or contract. Yes. Uh, the state, as taxpayers know, raised taxes in January of 2011. Uh, that is bringing in, going to bring in somewhere in the neighborhood of $8 billion. It's projected over the course of the fiscal year. Mm -hmm. um, did you have a thought on that, given the state's finances? Did you think that that was something the government should should have done, should not should not have done, or do you not really get involved in the fiscal policy? We really don't get involved in the fiscal policy. The reason is, is because we just want the public to know the numbers. And if we sort of say, oh, well, you shouldn't cut raise taxes, or you should, then people are going to go, well, your numbers back up that. They're not truthful numbers, they back up what your assumption, what you want to have happen. Um, I would say that, you know, the state does have a long-term cash shortfall, which we calculate is $110 billion of money that they just don't know where they're going to get that money to pay all those bills. Um, and the only way to fix a long-term cash shortfall is to either bring more money in or take less money out. And I'll leave it to the conservatives to fight the case on whether if you do a tax increase that brings more money in or not. Um, it's not for us to decide. T tell us a little bit more about uh, your organization, Truth in Accounting. What's, what's its big picture and how long have you been doing this? We started, I started the Institute in 2002, so we've been doing a while. We started on the federal side um, because I realized that in 2000, there really wasn't a budget surplus, um, and that election, you know, remember, go, remember we had surpluses as far as the eye could see, and Bush was going around saying, you know, we're going to return those that surplus in the form of a tax cut to the public, and Gore was putting it in that lockbox, and every day, in essence, I was shaking my TV going, there isn't a <laughs> surplus, and the, the elect, then once the election was over, I realized the federal government's the largest financial organization in the world. And we elected the leader of that based upon fuzzy numbers. And so I felt compelled to start the Institute. And that election, if you use the good numbers, we didn't have a surplus. We were $20 trillion in the hole with the baby boomer retirement coming up. And that election maybe should have been about those issues instead of how to spend a fictitious surplus. And when you look at the federal government or the state of Illinois, what kind of accounting errors do you typically find? Well, we find, again, mostly those off-balance sheet liabilities. So on the federal government side, the federal government on their balance sheet shows no Social Security or Medicare liability because it is the government's official line that the government does not owe anybody any Social Security or Medicare benefits beyond the checks that are currently written. Um, and there's no trust fund. Um, so I, I, what the biggest thing I find is what is told to the public and what is really going on. And the same a thing. A massive in, gap. Yeah, a massive gap. So then the public, we believe it's a, part, a problem in democracy because 
you know, the electorate is the basis of the sound, you know, our sound republic, and if the public is given the wrong information, they're making decisions based on the wrong information. And I think that part of this, you know, dis disillusion with elected officials now is that people know at some level they're not being told the truth. And in Illinois, they've been told for decades that we've balanced our budget. And so to you and me, that would mean we shouldn't be into, in debt, and we're $110 billion in debt. And I think public, even if they're not paying attention to it closely, just sort of go, How, what are they doing down there? And you know, they get disillusioned. I, I, again, not to editorialize, but my own master's thesis back in 1992 to 93, before I knew I was coming to Illinois, was on the coming collapse of publicly funded pension systems. Mm -hmm. uh, because they're just, they, they were making way too many promises that uh, there wasn't going to be money available to pay. Yes, and they're, they're still in that situation. And we believe a big part of that was that they were not required to report those. And our study found, our 50 state financial state of the state study found, that the states have incurred more than $900 billion of liability for pensions and retiree health care benefits, and only 9% of those are reported on their balance sheets. As we tape this uh, in Chicago, uh, the Illinois Channel just recently recorded the comments of Governor Scott Walker of Wisconsin. And the people will probably, the viewers, will be aware that there was quite a hullabaloo and uh, protesters uh, taking over the Wisconsin state capitol for some months uh, over the spring and early summer of 2011 uh, because of changes that he was making. Uh, I believe at the time the budget deficit that they were facing was somewhere in the order of $300 million. Uh, Governor Walker was saying he's made reforms. He was comparing and contrasting Wisconsin to Illinois, in essence saying Wisconsin is a, a better state uh, not only to do business in but better managed. Uh, what, uh, when you did all the different states and you look at Wisconsin, what did you find with Wisconsin and what if any lessons are happening there that might be actually applicable to Illinois? We did find a small taxpayer, not small, it was seven hundred. I believe $7,000 per taxpayer in Wisconsin. 7000 instead yes. of $26,800 right. for Illinois. Right, and um, what we found is that in Wisconsin, they are actually using pretty truthful numbers in their balanced budget requirement. Uh, their requirement has that they have to use generally accepted accounting principles, and so you mentioned a $300 million deficit that they were trying to fight in Wisconsin. Honestly, in Illinois, that's a rounding error. Our deficit that we were facing was $13 billion. And, but the difference is they use the good num pretty good numbers. Their retiree health care benefits are a little bit not calculated right, but comparatively, they use pretty good numbers. And so the question is, why did they have the tumultuous budget process in Madison, but not in Wisconsin? And it's because we hide the fact that we really don't balance our budget. So therefore, we don't have to make the tough decisions. They use good numbers. They have to truthfully balance their budget. They include all the costs, all the pension uh, compensation costs. And so therefore, they understand that, oh, our revenues are not equaling all the cost. And so we have to fix that. In Illinois, we don't, in, we don't have that situation because we don't include all of our costs and we bump up the revenue by including things like loan proceeds as money that you can spend to balance the budget. Let's go back to that last one because I, I want to look at, uh, go, let's go through some of the gimmick, gimmicks mm -hmm. that government, uh, at least in the state of Illinois, pulls. So if you have a loan and someone's giving you back the loan, Mm -hmm. You're saying they, they count that as income, as yes. revenues. Yes. Well, you have to look at the balanced budget requirement. And the, the Constitution says that your expenditures have to equal your funds available. So, and that's the amount that goes into your checkbook. So if you borrow money, does that not become available? And so they can balance the budget by not including, they can balance the budget by including those loan proceeds because those proceeds go into their checkbook. And then on the disbursement side, they only include the checks that they write. So again, going back to the pensions, they're not writing pe checks for current for pensions that people are earning right now. You know, part of somebody's compensation package is they get salaries, they get 
they earn the right to receive these pensions and they earn the right to receive these retired health care benefits. And so that's their total compensation package. But in the budget calculations, all they have to include is the salary amount because the other two, they're not going to write the check until years to come. So that doesn't have to be included in their balanced budget calculation. So they've just gone ahead and promised these benefits and promised these benefits. If they funded them by writing a check, then that amount would have to be in the balanced budget calculation. So they don't fund them either. They just promise them, don't include those costs, then don't fund them, and then their budget is balanced, but we have hundreds of $100 billion of debt. Well, and the other one of the things they do, and it's for the same reason that you just mentioned, is that they, if they incur costs, if they hire a, someone to do the printing for the state or provide other services in, in a fiscal year, they may stick those bills in a drawer and not pay them until the following fiscal year. Right, right. and we have um, estimates between $4 billion and $8 trillion of bills, in essence, hiding in drawers because if I don't write the check for it, I don't have to include it in my balanced budget calculation. Relative to uh, accounting gimmicks, mm -hmm. do you have any sense of Illinois you would rank us relative to the other states? I would probably rank them number one. Is that the, right? um, the gimmicks that they play are just the best one recently was uh, I believe that the bond houses came to the state and said, we're not going to issue any more bonds for you until you do pension reform. So the governor and the legislator, before any of the stakeholders could catch wind that they had to do pension reform, they passed pension reform within like 12 hours. You know, 30 minutes debate on the House, 30 minutes debate on the Senate. That thing went through, in essence, in the dead of the night because they didn't want the stakeholders to catch wind. But... They could only do it for, they only did it for future employees. So somebody that starts working in January of 2012, 13, and then beyond. So then they're going to, in, in 30 or 40 years, we're going to save money, you know, not have to pay as much out. Right. But what the governor did is said, oh, look it, I saved the state all of this money. And present, or did some present value or some calculation and said, since I saved all that much money now, that represents $300 million in today's dollars. And he had a line in the budget of, in essence, revenue of $300 million that he could spend. It was just... Did you say $300 billion? Million. I'm sorry. Million. If I, okay. yeah, the B's and the T's and the M's yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> get very confusing. Amazing. Uh, why do they do that? Have you talked to, have you gone down and talked to lawmakers and said, number one, you, you know, we want you to stop doing this. Uh, do, you, do you try to consult with them? And to what extent, if you have, or are the lawmakers or anyone in government listening? We've had legislative forums for both Republicans and Democrats. One, they're usually shocked at the numbers. They're like, what? We, we thought we were, some of them years ago thought that when we first went down, said we thought we were balancing our budget. Budget. Other ones said, no, the liability on the balance sheet is a lot less than you're showing. We said, well, yeah, but you have these off-balance sheet liabilities. Um, I think other people's efforts and ours as state under pe legislators to understand they have a big problem. Um, I believe, honestly, the rank and file members do want to do something about it, and you know, we've gotten interest from both sides. Um, we've had um, two bills introduced. Uh, we we helped them draft, which was the Truth and Accounting Act and the Long-Term Accounting Act uh, were introduced and got bipartisan support. Um, but I, honestly, I think that you know people, the top four, um, just and the governor, you know, just don't. That stakeholders are such a strong force that they can't get changes made. You know, we have a, a federal at the federal level. We have a, a the Securities and Exchange Commission because we say to publicly traded companies, you have to open your books and engage in generally accepted accounting practices and if you don't if you if you hide things and sweep things under the rug which sometimes businesses will do uh, they would be subject to prosecution uh, by the federal government uh, at least on paper that's how the system goes yes. to work uh, now we all know the example of Bernie Madoff was out there and the federal government was not catching wind of what he was doing should there be some kind of similar program somebody that would try to hold these different levels of government accountable for the way they, they engage account. in their accounting. 
Uh, I would say that would be the voters. Um, the SEC is looking into that $300 million game that the governor played with the uh, future pension co benefits. Um, and, but the SEC is trying to protect the bondholders. Honestly, there isn't anybody out there in Illinois trying to protect the taxpayers from all of these games. And, you know, our point is that the taxpayers don't even have, know the, the information they need to know that there's a problem. So it, it's our job to educate them, and then once they know that there's a problem, to force their legislators to, to make changes. Everyone knows the state budget is so far out of whack, it's not even close to being balanced, but we still have a balanced budget requirement in the Constitution. Yes. Uh, and what, what we'd say is that, you know, it all depends on how you count and they use a very sophisticated system down there called political math. And so that game allows them to go into debt even though they are uh, balancing their budget. And I think that the public has always understood, hold it, the state has been fine. We're, we've balanced our budget. And we're, we've been pointing out for years, no, you really haven't been balancing your budget. And that balanced budget, thing, it's not an accounting thing. It's, it's to, that's how you hold your politicians accountable. If the state were not a state, if it were a private business, looking at the dollars where we are now, would you say Illinois is bankrupt? In one sense of the word, that, you know, the pure definition of bankrupt, they, they're not. But there's another definition that says is if you don't have the money, to, if you have no idea where you're going to get the money to pay your bills, then you are bankrupt. Um, but legally, the state can't go bankrupt. They right. could repudiate their debt. Um, the other thing that we found in relation to the balanced budget requirement is the auditor, Dan, I mean, the state comptroller, Dan Hines, and now Judy well, Bart, former, yeah. former, and now Judy Bartopinka, in their audited financial statements, they quote the balanced budget requirement. And then right below it, it says, revenue and expenditure estimates have not been provided in accordance with these provisions. So you, in essence, have a constitutional officer of the state saying that the state is breaking the law. And there is nobody like the SEC or the Justice Department, because we're a, a sovereign state, that can go in and, as you say, protect the, the taxpayers from that. What about the uh, state comptroller? They're a uh, fiscal officer of the state. Do they have any powers to uh, be, hold the state more accountable? I have heard they have. I have not looked into the law, the specific law, but what you know, hearsay is that the state comptroller should not be writing checks off of an unbalanced budget. Um, so if they're admitting the budget is unbalanced, then they should not be writing checks. Uh, tell, us, uh, tell us a little bit more about why did you undertake this? You, you alluded to it back in 2000, listening to that uh, debate at the federal level between Bush-Gore. How, how did you then take the step to found the, uh, the Truth and Accounting Organization, and how are you funded? Uh, I, just, I felt just compelled that the public needed to know the facts, and so I started the Institute first funding it by myself. We have gotten some grants and now we're out looking for additional money because I've realized that um, the vision is so big that I could not personally fund it. Um, so we do have a board of directors and uh, with a very you know distinguished financial people and so, uh, attorneys and uh, always looking for new board members and you know going out and getting grants. It, it's hard, a little bit difficult for us because one, honestly, people think it's a political thing and I'm like, I don't care what you do with the numbers, um, but some people, oh, I don't want to get involved in politics. And it's like, we're not involved in politics. We just want the numbers out there. And then also, we, we do very well to not, try not to take money from one side or the other because again, if we take money from the left, then people on the right will say, well, your numbers just support the left agenda, um, and they're not really truthful, and, and this, the opposite on the right side. So we try to stay down the, the middle, um, and, but that makes fundraising also difficult because people look at your funding base and they're like, oh, well, they're funded from so-and-so, and I really don't want to be associated with that side. So, um, so it does make fundraising difficult, but we have to stay pure to our mission, and, and part of that is to find neutral funding. You, uh, you have in the, again, the report you came out with called the Financial State of the State, you have on the front cover the top five sunshine states and the bottom five sinkhole states. Do you know offhand, which do you recall, which are the five sunshine states? Wyoming, uh, Nebraska, Utah, and North Dakota and South Dakota. And when you say they're sunshine 
states? What makes them so? Why are they called that? They actually have more assets than liabilities, um, so they're those are fully funded. Um, and what we Nebraska was actually they're not Wyoming's the top state, but Nebraska when we were doing all the calculations was the first state that we ran across that had a positive number. And I sent the staff and the interns back to go, no, 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 <laughs> this must not be correct. Um, and they came back and said yes. And I was going to go speak in Nebraska that next week to the Association of Government Accountants, so I had to make sure our numbers were po correct. And so I called the state and I said, well, you know. We could not find any retiree health care liability. Um, so, you know, did we miss the schedule? And they said, we don't have any. And we're like, Illinois has $27 billion of these. I was like, how did you get away with not having those? And they described it that uh, what the employees, they are on almost a COBRA. If you retire before 65 um, and, are, and are not rec uh, entitled to Medicare, then you have to, in essence, pay COBRA. You know, you have to pay your benefits. You're still in the state plan, but you have to pay your benefits, a contribution for your benefit. So that's how they got away from the liability. How much, how much do former uh, state of Illinois employees pay for their health care? Uh, I am not sure. I think it's like for their health care. I don't know. They don't pay anything for their health care, their retiree health care. They do contribute to their pensions, but nothing to the retiree health care. And I said, how do you get, how did, Nebraska, how did you get away with, you know, because all the other states, the employees insist on having a retiree health care plan or the legislators have put that in. So I said, how did you get away with that? And they described it in the, you know, say, how did a state get into it is how they described it. So let's use uh, Michigan as an example. So this, the governments are always competing against corporations for employees. And in Michigan, the private sector employees, a lot of them had pensions and retiree health care benefits. Um, because they're the auto dealers, the mm -hmm. unions got them that deals. Um, so the, the our states that had a large, you know, corporate pension plans and retired health care plans had to match that. Um, but in Nebraska, they didn't have those large corporate pension plans. They didn't have unions to organize them. And so they didn't get into that business. Um, but states got into that business. And then as your thesis proved, the corporations got out of it because one, they had to start recording it, and two, the IRS made them start funding it. I mean, once they understood those costs, just like up in Wisconsin, they fund their pension plans. So they know how much they cost now, and so they go ahead and fund them now, and then they don't get into as much trouble. I believe the pension obligation for the state of Illinois in just one year is up to approximately six billion dollars and it's going to continue to ramp up uh, as we go forward. And I would say that number is even higher because that is that is just going by some arbitrary law that they passed that says the benefits will be funded in 90 percent by such and such a year. Right. But you mentioned wrapped up. So what they did is while the people who passed they it while in the office, I will have it be low mm -hmm. and it's going to ramp up and it's currently ramping up. And again, going back to the government's own financial, audited financial statements, I was shocked to see on their financial statements that their numbers is that Illinois in 2010 ran a $10 billion deficit, according to their numbers. Um, so. Is Illinois one of the, we, again, you have the top five sunshine states, you have the bottom five sinkhole states. What are the five bottom sinkhole states? It starts with um, Connecticut is the highest with, believe it or not, it's a scary number, $41,000 uh, per taxpayer. Uh, that's the amount that each taxpayer would have to pay the state's treasury to fund all the bills that they've already incurred. These are not bills that going forward. go, this is what they've incurred to date. Uh, so there's Connecticut, New Jersey, Illinois is third, uh, then uh, Hawaii, and then Kentucky. Um, before we run out of time, uh, tell us uh, if we want to get this report or follow your, what, what else do you have coming up? Do you have anything planned aside from the 50 states uh, review or are you going to be doing that on an annual basis or was that a one-time shot? We're, go we're doing that on an annual basis. We're already, those numbers are for 2009, which we had to use for two, two reasons. One, Illinois had not produced its financial statement when we were doing the research. Hawaii, just a couple um, weeks ago, finally issued their June 30, 2010 
financial statements, obviously, way after their fiscal year end. Um, and so for comparative purposes, we did 2009 comparison. So we're currently doing 2010, and then we're also going to do best practices. As you say, you know, why is Il what did Illinois do to get in this place, and what did the Sunshine States not do to so they're in a better shape? So we're looking at best practices. We're also doing a um, state data lab where we would there's no place where you can compare, you know, is it, are the state Illinois, you know, how are their finances, what's their GDP, what's their unemployment rate. So, you, you know, a, a reporter or a citizen can go in and compare states. So we're looking for funding right now to do a state data lab. Uh, and what is your website so that if people want to check out some of this information? It's truthinaccounting.org. So that's in, not and, truthinaccounting.org. And then we also have a state um, budgetwatch.org, which you can click on a map there and just get information on Illinois uh, itself. 2012 is an election year. How would you, if, peop, if voters said, you know, well, how can I use this information to make a more informed decision, what, what would you say? Well, number one, again, a lot of people think that the state's budgets have been balanced. They really don't understand how bad of shape we're really in. So take this report, and then when you go to the, um, the candidates, go to their forms, or even your own elected officials, say, hold it, we have this balanced budget requirement. To me, that would mean that we wouldn't be going into debt. So could, one, could you explain to me how that is happening? And then two, uh, which we also have a report, and then you know, ask them, you know, do you include loans, revenue, you know, proceeds as debt, and just question on that. And then ask them, in the future, are you going to continue to really not balance the budget when you say you are balancing the budget? All right, Shirley Weinberg, there's uh, much more we could talk about, but maybe oh, we can definitely. do it again in the future. <laughs> definitely, yeah. The report has, again, all these shenanigans, um, and there's another report called uh, Truth About Balanced Budgets, which goes into those uh, budget shenanigans even in more detail. Um, so they can get those out, download those off of our website. All right, well, Sheila Weinberg, thanks right. again for joining us. Well, thank you, and I look forward to talking to you again in the future. You're watching the Illinois Channel, an independent nonprofit corporation form to provide gavel to gavel coverage of Illinois state government and other public affairs events taking place across Illinois.